welcome to Med Head Nerd Podcast, episode 11, live on YouTube for the first time. Uh, I'm your host, Vika Slanyan, and as always, I'm joined by my delightful co-host, Mike Balian, where we discuss our great Armenian history covering different people, eras, and events. How are you, Mike? I'm a little nervous. Yeah. Thanks to you. Oh, well, I mean, we, we had to do this eventually, right? Uh, yeah, but, you know. Yeah, very exciting. Very exciting. We got... Uh, we got some viewers. Thank you for joining us. Please like and share. Uh, I think we're live on Facebook as well. So um, you can chat live through us. And, and if you have any questions, you can, you know, on the site, there's the chat option. Um, today's topic is history of Cilicia. And our guest is historian Gevok Nazarian. This is going to be a great show as Gevork is so knowledgeable about our history. Uh, I mean, I can listen to him all day. I know. Yeah. Um, now, before I introduce Gevork uh, I, and start our topic, I want to talk about a few things. First, I want to thank everyone who keeps writing to us um, and sending us messages through Instagram. Um, it's so overwhelming and we're humbled. So many people have reached out to us. Yeah, it's pretty interesting getting some messages from people all over the world, man. Yeah, yeah. Like and uh, a couple of people I want to mention. Uh, first, um, Andrew Chadborn from Portland, Maine, who's listening to us. Uh, we had a nice chat th uh, through Instagram with him. And uh, he said, he, you know, he gave us so much great feedback. And he said something that stuck with us. And, uh, and I'm going to quote him uh, as far as for the podcast. He said, keep it up truth must prevail your podcast is a candle burning in the dark um uh, thank you that means so much to us uh, andrew um so you know we got plenty of uh listeners it, it's 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 growing by the numbers we're yeah. almost three thousand subscribers now which is amazing we've been on this is our 11th episode so basically three thousand yeah yeah um so uh another person who reached out to us uh we have a listener from uh blairsville georgia and her name is emily wilson now she messaged us uh, on instagram and i was driving so i had my wife diana read the message to me and i honestly got a little bit emotional because it, it meant so much and i just want to read what she wrote um this is what emily said I'm so grateful to have found this podcast. My maternal grandmother, uh, grandmother is 100% Armenian. Her father and his brother escaped Armenian genocide and were able to make it to Greece and eventually came to the U.S. in 1921 and lived in the Bronx and built their life. Um, learning more about my Armenian heritage has helped me understand myself as an individual, individual a little better. Through some of the genetic testing, like 23andMe, which I've done as well, um, that I've done, I was so surprised to see how strong the Armenian genetics are. Even in my daughter, her Armenian genetics are still at a very prominent percentage, even though it's been diluted, for the lack of a better term. We live in rural, uh, rural Georgia, USA, so it's important to me that my daughter learns about her Armenian heritage and just how special and ancient it is, and then pass this to on her children one day. She also says the connection with uh, the connection that we Armenians feel to each other can only be understood by other Armenians. So thank you for taking the time to share your research on this podcast. I'm, I'm curious what states we don't occupy. Yeah, I know. And rural <laughs> Georgia. I mean, that's amazing. And, you know, you and I set out this goal uh, and it was to reach you know, everyone around the world, Armenians, non-Armenians, but especially Armenians who may not know that they're Armenian or... Or uh, maybe our third, fourth generation. Yeah, or something that, like that, that much, you know? they don't know much about their history. Yeah. Uh, it could be through marriage or just generation changing uh, without the, the knowledge being passed on. Yeah. And so this certifies that, uh, you know, what we set out to do is working. And yeah, this has always is. been our goal. It is. So... Um, Okay, so let's officially start the show. Uh, mm -hmm. Our guest is historian Gevok Nazarian, who has been patiently waiting in the green room. <laughs> we should bring him in, right? Yeah, we should bring yeah, him in. Okay, all right, Gevok, are enough, you ready? Enough jail time for him. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> hi, Gevok, how are you? Hello. Hi, guys. How's it going? Hi, Gevok. 
Good. Thank you. Um, so let me officially introduce those of you who don't know uh, Georg Nazarian. Georg is a historian who received his BA and MA in history and Armenian studies from UCLA. And after completing his extensive research in the National Archives of Armenia, received his PhD from the uh, Yerevan State University. His field of interest within Armenia, uh, Armenian history is broad, covering different periods from the ancient uh, from the Asian times to present times, basically. Um, Gevork, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you've been thank a great you. friend to the show. Thank and you for having me, uh, Vai, uh, Vai and Mike. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving this great opportunity. You know, pleasure yeah, and course. honor, as always. <laughs> um, you know, we, we we love history, and you're you're someone who has helped us, you know. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for all, your information. Yeah, with the research and everything, um, and, and we're grateful for that. So, and when it came to the history of Cilicia, as much as we, you know, you can do a lot of research, and especially from your writings, uh, we just felt it'd be right to hear it from you, because I, I think... You know, it, it yeah, wouldn't do justice for yeah, us to it's do a, it. Yeah. Well, it's a major, it's a major source of our research. You know, um, a lot of the information you've spent your life, you know, putting together. It's some of the stuff is mind blowing. The information that you have available for people like us and others around the world really is. So yeah. thank you from, from, from both of us. And by the way, thank you for uh, waking up. <laughs> he's, he's in Armenia. It's, yeah, it's, 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 what time is it? It's, uh, it's like 7 a.m. 7, 7 a.m. Wow. 7 7 11. 11. <laughs> yeah. Talking about Kingdom of Cilicia at 7 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for doing that. Um, so, um, I mean, to start the show, you know, we want to talk about Cilicia. Yeah. Good, so, morning. Good morning, Kilikia. Yep, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so we have some questions for you, obviously. Sorry, I'm scrambling here because I have also, uh, you know, multiple uh, things multiple things happening. happening. We have, uh, we're live on Clubhouse as well, by the way. So we might get some uh, questions from there. And to all the people who are watching, if you have questions, you can, like I said, through the live chat, you can send your question and uh, end of the show, we'll have Gevork answer it. So... Um, do you want to kind of, well, um, you know, we have put together a bunch of questions that we are going to absolutely grill you with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so get ready to enter the gauntlet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's <laughs> what do they call it when they're, um, uh, with the cops do it interrogation interrogation yeah well my mind's full on historical working, yeah. interrogation yeah. um so so to start off uh what i wanted to do is you know first question is obviously we want to know uh, the the beginning of it so um if if we were to go back in time uh what would be the earliest history of cilicia and when do we see the armenian presence give birth in the cilician region Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, um, as many as many know, Cilicia is actually you know it's it's uh, in a in a region which is uh, basically called the Eastern Mediterranean Sea Basin, uh, and it's 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 a region that uh, basically is part of a historic uh, Armenian homeland because. What is interesting, uh, guys, is that um, the mountainous area of Cilicia, the Taurus mountain, uh, mountains, and uh, mountainous Cilicia is actually uh, an area that the Armenian highland or Armenian plateau begins from. So uh, throughout history, our most ancient kingdoms uh, were actually located in in, in in an area that at least partly encompassed this part of Cilicia. So uh, basically, uh, the Armenian presence, you can safely say, comes from the most ancient times. There were a number of ancient Armenian kingdoms that unfortunately we don't know a lot, but we do know that were located in this area adjoining Specifically, uh, uh, I'm talking about the kingdom of Hayasa, which is mentioned in ancient 
in tight inscriptions of the second millennia, millennium BC, uh, Mitanni, which is again mentioned in mid second millennium BC, and other kingdoms. So, from the most ancient times, guys, uh, Armenians were actually living in this area in Cilicia. And as I said, even Armenian highland begins from the Taurus Mountains, which are basically the mountainous part of uh, So, uh, you know, uh, th this, this is an important point that we have to make. And I also want to add that sometimes some people, they only think of like the territory of Greater Armenia. Remember in the last show, we talked about Greater Armenia, which was made up of uh, 15 provinces of uh, uh, Armenia. Uh, but uh, Armenia itself is much greater than even Greater Armenia, okay? Because Greater Armenia only encompassed that territory which reached uh, the Euphrates River. But to the west, of the Euphrates River was the territory that it was called Lesser Armenia or Armenia Minor. So this is also Armenia, guys. And parts of Armenia Minor actually extended all the way to the Taurus Mountains. And at times, you know, uh, it, it, it shrank and it again expanded. Lesser Armenia, I'm talking about. And, you know, the Greeks themselves pointed out that, you know, Armenia is also to the west of the Euphrates River, and times even, you know, reaching the Black Sea and going all the way down to the territory of the Taurus Mountains, which is, again, as we said, this area of Cilicia, Cappadocia, and in, in even the Armenian sources also mention that, you know, it has a very significant Armenian population from the most ancient times and, you know, was part of this, you know, Armenian world, if we can put it in, the, in that way. So, the Armenian presence in this territory, you can say, begins from the most archaic ancient times. Yeah, we 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 mentioned it in the Tigran Great uh, series that you know when he was conquering a lot of the lands to the west, there was a lot of Armenian population that remained from centuries upon centuries prior to that, and right. it was just a matter of bringing everybody together, and you know forming what was the Armen Armenian Empire at the yeah, time. Yeah, you know, that's true. right. That's yeah. true. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mike, you're absolutely right. Uh, that was uh, uh, like in 83 BC when Tigran the Great mm -hmm. incorporated Cilicia into his, you know, Armenian state or an uh, Armenian empire. But uh, an important p uh, point to be made, you're making a good point. Like Cilicia, as we said, like always had Armenian population, but, you know, politically, most of the time it was obviously outside of Armenia. Yeah. You know, it was part of uh, ancient kingdoms. You know, I said, like I mentioned, those early Armenian states. But after that, um, you know, politically, it fell under various empires that, you know, later on expanded and took over this area. Although for the time being, which is also quite interesting, a kingdom of Arada uh, also incorporated these areas through the conquest of Menua and especially Argishti I, also incorporated parts of Cilicia into his empire. But, you know, it switched hands so many times. And later on, it was part of the Seleucid Empire. Uh, the Seleucids, as you know, was uh, yeah. you know, one of the off offshoots when the empire of uh, Alexander the Great uh, split into three parts. The Seleucids, which, you know, uh, was uh, Seleucids was one of the generals of, of uh, Alexander the Great. He created his own empire. And Cilicia became part of that empire. Later on, it became part of the Roman Empire. But very briefly, as you rightly pointed out, it was actually part of the Armenian state yeah. during the reign of Iran the Great. Uh, and, you know, um, it's also quite interesting. I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but even uh, Roman, we have Roman accounts from the 4th century that actually mention that you know, Armenia begins or Armenian presence begins uh, in this area, Eastern Mediterranean Sea Basin. And actually, there's a famous uh, Roman historian, Ammianus Marcellinus, who, uh, you know, in the fourth century, he actually named and called uh, with the Gulf of Alexandretta, which is in this uh, Cilician uh, area in the 
Eastern Mediterranean uh, Sea Basin. He called it the Armenian Gulf or, or Gulf of Armenia. So even like Roman uh, historians uh, and, 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 and sources mentioned that, there, that you know, uh, Armenians were already uh, in, in very significant numbers during this time. And I think this is an important point because sometimes, you know, people think that, you know, the Armenian presence dates from medieval or late medieval times, like especially in the 11th century. But, you know, this is the contrary to historic evidence. There was already pretty si- significant Armenian presence, very significant presence. Yeah. And, and you know, like, like we've been we, like you've been saying, we've had we've had Armenians in different states, different provinces, different areas, r- very relevant areas in and across a, what, what's called Asia Minor, right? So it, what, what I want to know is, what, what do some of the mainstream sources or classical sources tell us about that relationship between Armenians in Kilikia and Armenians from greater Armenia or different parts of, you know, predating the Kilikian times, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Like, I... Uh, well, like I said, a, a very important source is uh, Ambianus Marcellinus, which mm-hmm. is an important, you know, classical uh, historian uh, of the fourth century, and he obviously basically points out that you know, uh, like, you know, Armenia, even Armenia as a country, begins in this area roughly. So it's even beyond Greater Armenia, as I pointed out. And what is interesting, there is also another very important source. Uh, John Chrysostom, who was actually patriarch of Constantinople, he also talks about like very significant in the fourth century, significant Armenian presence in in, in Cilicia. Uh, to such an extent, Mike, that uh, already by the uh, sixth century, the Byzantines obviously Cilicia was incorporated into the Byzantine Empire, uh, which also was known as the Eastern Roman Empire, or we call it as an Eastern Roman Empire. They they thought of themselves as the Roman Empire. Uh, but, you know, it was part of Byzantium. But what is interesting is that it, for most part, this area of uh, Lesser Armenia and Cilicia and Cappadocia and even adjoining areas, vast areas, was were known as the Armenia theme. A team was basically a structure. It was a military political structure that um, the Byzantines divided their empire into. And the Armenia team was a large, vast land, which obviously had more the name Armenia, uh, which was made up of those territories that the Byzantines actually conquered of Armenia. So Cilicia, Cappadocia, all the way to the uh, Black Sea and extending down to the Mediterranean Sea and reaching all the way well into the western parts of, you know, kingdom of former kingdom of greater Armenia, along with lesser Armenia, were part of this Armenia team. And even before that, the Byzantines actually divided this area into the first, second, third, and fourth Armenias as provinces of Byzantium. Uh, but it was sort of like more uh, incorporated into the Armenia team or Armenia team, as it was called in, in those sources, by, by Byzantium. So, you know, we clearly see, uh, Mike, that, you know, it, it, you know, obviously there had to be a very significant Armenian population. And obviously, we know, you know, there weren't only Armenians here, there were Greeks, Syrians and different nationalities, but it was very significant presence, Armenian presence that, you know, the Byzantines uh, decided to, you know, uh, basically name this area the Armenia team. And um, another important aspect is for the most part, the area was defended by local Armenian princes, the Nakharars. Uh, we talked about the Nakharars last time, which was the Armenian aristocracy. Mm-hmm. So basically, Locally, most of the towns throughout Cilicia, Cappadocia, you know, this Armenia team were ruled by local Armenian governors. Uh, not all of them. Some of them were Greek. Some of them were other nationality. But, you know, our, the Armenian uh, presence was the most important. And since the team, as I said, it was administrative, but also military unit, obviously the, the you know, the aristocracy, 
uh, played a key role because it provided the armed forces made up of the Armenian army, yeah. especially the cavalry, in defense of this sort of like a, you know, it was like a, a borderland area with at that time in the still 7th century, 6th, 7th century with Sasanian Iran. And later on, when Sasanian Iran was taken over by the Arabs against the Arab Caliphate. So it, it formed this sort of like fortified buffer, which was defended mostly by still, you know, Armenian uh, local places. Okay. Well, that kind of, <laughs> you, yeah. co- you covered uh, the question I had about the Byzantine Empire. I was, so. was, was going to say, uh-huh. like, Vic, uh, Vic, you just had your uh, question uh, stolen. Yeah, I know. You just, uh, <laughs> that was just taken right out of it. No, but. Uh, no, 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 it's uh, fine. I, I, I had a question I, about the Byzantine Empire, okay. but you, you answered it. So, you know, but <laughs> I'll, I'll just go to my uh, next one, uh, which is, um, l- let's talk a bit about the Rubinian dynasty. Um, what was the background uh, of uh, of the first, basically, uh, uh, Ruben the first, I should say? Right, right. Uh, so, like we said, um, um since already there was a very significant Armenian presence in this area before uh, even, you know, the uh, Ruben established his principality, um, it was, it was, it wasn't, it, it wasn't a difficult task to muster enough of uh, forces to accomplish this task. So, uh, as I said, uh, while, uh, you know, Armenian lords for most part already in the 10th, especially in the 11th century, established a very important presence. A lot of these Byzantine governors, officials, they were, you know, Armenians with their own armed forces. Uh, and um, even before Ruben uh, the first, as we came to know him, established himself, uh, are several important key Armenian lords, they established themselves in this area. So to give a brief background, what happened, uh, what, which was a very cataclysmic thing, in uh, 1045, the kingdom of Bagratuni in, uh, in Armenia uh, fell. It was actually in, more incorporated into the Byzantine Empire, and a lot of the Armenian nobility, along with the king, King Gagi II, who was the last Bagratuni or Bagrat king, he actually relocated, they relocated their forces to territory of Lesser Armenia and some to territory of Cilicia. So there was even a further influx of Armenian nobility, Armenian, you know, just general population in this area, which basically created only the background for Ruben to come to power. So uh, when uh, Gagik II actually died, already in, 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 in Caesarea, in, in Kesaria, which is in less, Lesser Armenia, uh, in, in Cappadocia, this area, uh, he basically, uh, Ruben was uh, one of the uh, nobles of Bagratuni lineage, actually, of Bagratuni background, who after the passing of death of Gandhi II, who was actually unfortunately assassinated in 1079, uh, he actually... Uh, decided to move down to the area of mountainous Cilicia, the, tor- the impregnable, this is a very impregnable area of the Taurus Mountains, as we talked about. He decided to re- relocate into this area, which already uh, by, was controlled by an Armenian important lord by the na- name of Bahram uh, uh, Barajnuni. So Va- Bahram Barajnuni, who actually controlled this vast area extended from Lesser Armenia all the way to Antioch, incorporating the swath of land and part of Cilicia, actually controlled it. So Ruben, when he came, he basically like joined forces with uh, Varan Varajmu. Uh, but quickly, Ruben, in his own right, he basically rose to the occasion uh, he, first of all, established himself in a stronghold, stronghold of Kopitar, which is in the Taurus Mountains, as I said. And in 1080, he proclaimed himself as a prince of this principality, uh, of uh, Rubenic principality, Armenian principality. And obviously, it was named after him. 
So he, being the founder named Ruben, the succeed uh, rulers were named Rubenites who came after him. So he established the Rubenid dynasty in 1080. And basically, uh, he, uh, he quickly, uh, after that, uh, Rubenids uh, ex- expanded their territory. They conquered new castles and strongholds in the Taurus Mountains, initially just in uh, mountainous Silesia area, but ultimately, especially in the 12th century, quickly extended the rule through uh, plains of Silesia, which is the territory adjoining immediately the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and, you know, it, it, as I said, in, in a matter of few decades, uh, it, it became a very powerful principality that the local uh, Byzantine and other rulers, uh, powers, Muslim power, Byzantine powers, later on Crusader powers, had to take into account. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's, that's what I wanted to get to next because we're we're from, you know, based on the timeline, we're going into what the 11, we're in the 11th century. Yeah. Right. And I'm, I'm fascinated, always have been, even before I considered myself a history buff or a history fanatic. Um, I've always been fascinated with the crusades. I don't know why I just always have. Um, and going into the crusades, um, we know that Armenia played or Kilikia Armenia played a massive, massive role in a lot of those travel routes from Europe through to the Middle East, you know, down south, um, from the Christian crusaders and so on and so forth, even the Muslim crusaders going back and forth. What, how important was that role that the Armenians played during this time? Right, right, that's a, that's a great question, Mike. Uh, well, you know, if if you if you love the Crusades, Cilicia and Armenian history is for you. You know, yeah, I, know. <laughs> I mean, it's so intertwined with the Crusades, Mike. It's it's just you know part and parcel. Uh, in fact, you know, it's it's even like various popes and other you know authors have said it. You know, without the Armenian uh, role in the Crusades, it the, the outcome would be totally different. You know, it was it, like the first crusade would be even a total fa- failure, and later crusades would most probably not even take place. You know, if Armenians did not take part and actually not, you know, help out the crusaders and later on the crusader states. So very briefly, just to point out, uh, Mike, uh, the crusade, as you know, uh, began in 1096, and by 1097, you know, on the call of of Pope. Uh, basically, they reached uh, this territory of first Asia Minor, you know, before that, obviously, Constantinople, Asia Minor. And in 1097, they already reached uh, Cilicia, Cilician Armenia. And um, uh, at that time, already, it was ruled by Constantine, uh, Uben, Constantine of uh, Cilicia, uh, Armenian prince. Uh, and then he basically, in 1097, he played a very important role in providing provisions for this, you know, already at this time, very weakened, emaciated, uh, crusader troops. And uh, very quickly, uh, the crusaders were able to recuperate. And, you know, uh, Armenian detachments also, you know, uh, joined the crusader army and it marched, first of all, to the Armenian city controlled by Armenians, Prince Toros, to the pre uh, city of uh, at that time known as Edessa, but historically Armenian Urha, uh, also later on known as Urfa. So uh, first of all, the Crusaders, est- with Armenian help actually, with help of Prince Toros, they established themselves in um, in Edessa, and then later on, a little bit later, basically Baldwin, who was one of the leaders of, of the Crusades, he actually established himself as the king of Jerusalem. Uh, so and the kingdom of Jerusalem was established, again, with, you know, uh, massive Armenian support. Antioch was taken before that, and then, uh, you know, other, uh, like, yeah. he established. Yeah, and, and the, the, so, the, so the history of Armenia at this time, Cilician Armenia, is very closely... Inter- intertwined 
with with, with the crusade. Now, I have a, I have a follow up question to that. I know it wasn't on our <laughs> list for our, our interrogation. You don't have to follow. You. <laughs> yeah. So I but but you know I know a little bit about this time period, so I have to ask this question because it sparked when you were talking about the Crusaders. Now, with the Crusaders, we had the Knights Templar and different Knights factions, correct? That may have been. I guess call it occupying, not occupying, but kind of settling in that area for what hundreds of years. So, can is there anything that you can elaborate on on how the Armenians of Kilikia became, I guess, intertwined with a lot of these knights factions, especially? And I know for a fact that the Knights Templar, famous Knights Templar, were also involved in this time period in that area. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, well. As you mentioned, uh, Mike, uh, these like uh, orders, they were known as chivalric monastic orders. So all of them, like starting with the Knights Templars, which I believe is the oldest of them, uh, they also had a very important presence in Cilicia. Uh, the other uh, orders as well, uh, the Hospitallers, uh, the Teutonic Knights, again, very important order. Uh, they all, all established themselves, and actually, especially Mike, in the 12th century, the the Knights Templars played a very important role in uh, not only establishing themselves, but they actually were one of the allies of Armenian princes. The Rubenids were closely allied for most part. For most part, I say for most part because you know this is an important thing. At times, you know, even Crusader states fought with each other. For example, like the uh, like the Kingdom of Jerusalem would fight against uh, you know uh, County of Edessa and Antioch would fight against like Cilicia at times, and then uh, Muslim states that were adjoining these states they would also fight fight the Crusaders, fight the Armenians, but at times they would uh, actually be allied with the Armenians and uh, actually fight maybe another Crusader state. Then would they would suicide so I think it's also important to remember that it wasn't like clear cut like this holy war of Muslims fighting the Christians you know um, but uh, uh, coming back to these orders uh yeah you're absolutely right in fact uh, 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 one of princes uh, Rubeni rulers Le, his name was Male. He, he ruled from 1170 to 1175. Before uh, rising to power, he was actually you know, one of the commanders of the Templars. So Malay was a key figure in Cilician Armenia uh, in 1160, I'm sorry, 1160s. And later on, he became you know a ruler in 1170 and 1175. So that's just one example. And, and the Templars, they had very important castles that, you yeah. know, throughout in Armenia that they actually controlled. Very important castle, which was like on the borderline of Cilicia and Antioch, is the castle, no, was the castle of Bagras. Yeah. Oh, castle of Bagras. Uh, that was like an important castle that, you know, was a, a Templar castle, but many others as well. But Bagras was a very large, important castle. And later on, Mike, we also see, especially after uh, the reign of uh, Levon the Magnificent in the 13th century, you know, uh, Ostrogoths and the Teutonic Knights, they sort of basically rose more to prominence than, for example, the Teuton uh, than the Templars. Yeah. So these two orders, then they, in the 13th century, during the reign, for example, of um, Levon the Magnificent and succeeding like Hetum the First and others, uh, these orders played a more prominent role. So, like in the Armenian court, you would have like Armenian knights. They you would have also allied like knights of these chivalric orders were, were also had a very important presence. And just generally, we can talk about that. I mean, like I said, you know, this all stemmed from the fact, Mike, that at this time Armenia uh, and Cilician Armenia, for most part, this is also an important point. Like. It was actually called Kingdom of Armenia because it was in Cilicia that the Armenian state was restored. So it's important, guys, that at that time in the sources, it's not 
called Cilicia or even Cilicia in Armenia. It's called, you know, Kingdom of Armenia. The king of yeah. Cilicia was king of Armenia. Yeah. King of Armenia. You know, it's, it was the Armenian kingdom. This is how, like, European and Muslim and all other sources were calling our kingdom. You know, so, you know since you mentioned yeah. that, I, I want, you know, when we're talking about the, the first crusade, like during that time, Um, what type of relationship or ties were built between uh, Armenia and like Western Europe, basically? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great follow-up question. Of, uh, well, it's like the evidence is so clear. Like when we look even at the uh, some of the titles held by the uh, various officials of the court, we see there's such a huge uh, influence. Uh, like... Formerly, the titles that we had, like spot up it for 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 example, uh, during the Cilician Armenia time, became known as constable, or in Armenian variation was gunstable or gundestable. But it's like it's from the from European constable, the chancellor, which is again like medieval Western European position, was a uh, chancellor that was like in Armenian yeah. um, and. And another interesting thing that I think you would uh, find quite interesting is that uh, the word that we even have today in modern Armenia for mister, which is baron, or in Western Armenian, uh, we say baron, or right? Baron, right? It comes from this period. It's from baron. baron yeah. Yeah. It's like baron, like Same. baron, Same which spelling. at this time were like the aristocracy, like the barons. Mm -hmm. They called it the baron. So and so, you know, part of so. So it, it, even it survives today in our modern Armenian usage, this heritage. Yeah, you know, that's amazing. <laughs> Which is quite a, so. Yeah, and like um, a lot of other things. Like there was, a, and I, I have to make this point clear. It wasn't only one way, right? Like it wasn't just Armenians incorporating a lot of these elements. The Crusaders and the Western Europeans, in their own right, were learning from Armenians and incorporating some of the Armenian, for example, I don't know, like uh, architectural techniques, especially like church building, castle building. They learned a lot from the Armenian master builders. And there's a lot of research that, you know, as a result of this uh, close uh, intertwining of Western Europe with yeah. Kingdom of Armenia. Yeah, with Armenia, some of the, some of the was churches. a lot of back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, I mean, we're known with our uh, the domes of our churches, yeah. right? The architecture. Exactly. Um, yeah. That that was something. Oh that, yes, yes. You know, uh, a lot of there's people. an actually very important art historian. He has like a fundamental research. He's uh, like Austrian from a century ago, but still, it's a monumental work. He's called Joseph Strzygowski. He he did a very important. He like basically showed like how Armenian church architecture, castle building architecture. It basically, from this connections, ties of Armenians with Western Europe, it also spread uh, to throughout Europe and beyond, you know. And uh, it, it wasn't just like cultural, obviously, all kinds of ties, political, cultural, socioeconomic. I mean, the economy was very important. And, uh, you know, um, a lot of uh, Europeans, they established themselves in Cilicia and they... They had communities, merchants, and other like people that lived in Cilicia at this time from like Western Euro Europe. And, you know, uh, Armenian kings actually gave a lot of exemptions to these merchant communities, and that facili facilitated trade and commerce in Cilicia. So Armenian kings were wise enough to basically give a lot of these tax exemptions to these communities uh, from like cities like Venice, Pisa, Genoa, all over like from, from Belgium, from like different, different places. And these communities, merchant communities established themselves. And already by uh, the uh, 12th, and especially starting in the 13th century, Cilicia and Armenia established a very strong merchant navy. And it also established a very powerful uh, military navy. So it was yeah. at this time, Kingdom of Armenia was actually a very strong naval power because we had like access to the yeah. Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm.
Armenia was a Mediterranean power. It was a naval naval power of the time. Well, they had to and, be. They had to be in that yeah, region, you know. Exactly, and uh, important like example, Mike is like uh, Marco Polo. You know the famous mm-hmm. Venetian traveler. Of course. You know he actually recounts his story of traveling from Venice all the way to China, and he, he says that you know I I sailed on a, a Venetian ship. But, you know, before that, his uncle actually sailed on an Armenian vessel. Uh, and he says that, you know, in 1271, I embarked in the very famous port of Armenian port of Ayas. And then from when, when we actually uh, actually disembarked in Ayas, then we took the land journey to China through, you know, Cilicia, Armenia, yeah. all the way to like, through, you know, this area to, to China. Uh, and he says that you know he actually says that it was it's 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 a rich land with powerful you know economy the ports especially described Ayas and all other cities and it's very important that you know he actually you know this was the route like even the Venetians they, they you know the route was basically the Armenian port of Ayas so can you imagine how important of, of a course. port that was of course it would, um I, I have a question from uh, Vaughn on uh, who's listening on Clubhouse. He wanted to ask, can you, uh, he wants to ask if uh, Vostigon comes from Constable. No, it doesn't. Vostigon predates, you know, it has this uh, uh, ties with, uh, with, um, uh, with um, like Middle Persian, to be honest, like with Pahlavi and things like that. So it's like from the earlier period. It's not. It, it doesn't have to do with Constable, Gundestable. Gundestable is basically the archaic form of Gundestable would be Sparapet, which is the military supreme uh, commander of the Armenian armed forces. Got it. Well, there you go, Vaughn. <laughs> I know, I know you, earlier you mentioned, I know I might be backtracking here a little bit. Um, you were talking about the kingdom, you know, people, everyone was recognizing, you know, this is the kingdom of Armenia now. When exactly was that proclaimed when did this happen and maybe if you could shed some light on how it happened per se right 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 yeah so basically uh in the 12th century there were you know as we said like um, several crusades by the end of the 12th century so uh and that we had like several rulers after obviously ruben who established the principality ruben constantine uh, to- uh the uh, Levo, then Toros, I'm sorry, Toros, then Levo, and then other that followed princes. And by the uh, 12th century, uh, another crusade, the Third Crusade, was launched. And when the Third Crusade was launched by combined forces, different European forces, it reached um, Cilicia in 1190. So by this time already, uh, Cilicia was uh, very much Cilician Armenia, Kingdom of Armenia, as I should say. Uh, ha- uh, before that, obviously, Principality, Armenian Principality, had established itself uh, firmly. And when they reached, uh, headed by uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, who was basically the Holy Roman Empire, yeah. was German, modern Germany for the most part, this territory. Uh, so, um, he basically, uh, Levon, uh, who was at this time still a prince, Levon the Magnific- Mag- Magnificent, he actually helped this, uh, the Third Crusade. He actually joined forces with the Third Crusade. Even before that, Levon, you know, started his rule in 1187. He was quite, and even before that, uh, he, as, a, as a military commander, he was very successful in defeating the Seljuks, of, you know, the Seljuks had established themselves in Asia Minor uh, and to, to the basically north of uh, Cilician Armenia. So he was very famous, uh, you know, he succeeded in driving the Seljuks away. And he also helped to fight other Muslim powers, the emirs of Aleppo, Damascus, these territories in you know, present modern Syria and beyond. Uh, the Egyptian Mamluks and, and these forces later on. Uh, so, uh, so Frederick Barbarossa actually said that, you know, uh, you know, as an ally for your assistance, we're also going, you're going to have our support. So 
basically Levon uh, pre- pretty much firmly leveled the magnificence and by end of the 12th century, uh, Mike, he, he was already in very powerful position. Yeah. He was respected by all the powers of, of, the, of the area, of the ancient Levant and even be, beyond. Uh, so the Byzantines respected his authority, Levon the Magnificent. Uh, the Crusaders acknowledged his power. So did the Muslims as well, like the Muslim powers. So by 1198, Mike, he felt that he was strong enough to actually proclaim the kingdom, complete and powerful kingdom of Armenia. And that's what he exactly did. And 1198, on January the 6th, Armenian Christmas Day, January the 6th. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, he, he specifically chose Armenian Christmas to crown himself according to the Armenian rite uh, as the king of the restored kingdom of Armenia. And he became king of all Armenians. This is an an interesting thing because like by himself crowning the king of all Armenians, he actually acknowledged that his ultimate goal was the reunification under his kingdom of all Armenian territories yeah. of like greater Armenia, lesser Armenia, right? Because he was he, he was the authority and he was responsible for all Armenians. He was the king of all Armenians. Yeah, that goes, Armenia, back, Armenia, Armenia, yeah, Armenia. That goes back to what you were saying. Like, you know, it was it was the kingdom of Armenia, not just Cilicia. Exactly. That's that's what and it like, was. Uh, by, uh, to basically affirm that, like a lot of like for, uh, Armenians from other parts of Armenia, they would flock to this restored kingdom of Armenia. Yeah. So like Armenian scholars, like theologians, different, uh, like uh, from different monastic schools, they would come to Cilicia. They would come to the capital Cis. Uh, they would come to Tarsus. Actually, Levon the Magnificent was crowned in Tarsus, uh, in the city of Tarsus. They would come to Cis. They would come to Horonkala, which was an important learning center. And, uh, <coughs> A lot of our manuscripts of the period, medieval manuscripts, the, the best of them, I would say, Mike, were actually produced uh, during this uh, time. Uh, and, you know, some of the most outstanding Armenian uh, artists like uh, Toros Roslin, like Sarkis Pitsak, and many others, they actually completed their illuminated manuscripts, they, their masterpieces during this time under the patronage of the Armenian kings and queens. So, like, Armenian, there was, like, a huge cultural revival of Armenian culture during this time. And it was all thanks to the restoration of the Armenian independence, to the restoration of the kingdom of Armenia. So it was a very important role. And a lot of the most important manuscripts even we have today, for most part, uh, they actually survived from this period from the Cilician Armenian period. And the illuminated manuscript school of uh, Cilicia is considered one of the best, if not the best. Wow. Uh, so, so, yeah. So, uh, so I want to, like, it had a very signi- important significance and still does that, you know, this restoration of Armenian independence ushered in this new sort of, you know, sometimes people even call it the Silver Age. You know, you can argue it was like a second golden age. Of Armenian culture, but since, as you guys know, it's sometimes the golden age is considered the fifth century. Yeah. This is called like the silver age of yeah. Armenian culture and learning. Yeah. Um, but before I ask my next question, I just want to thank everybody who's joined us on YouTube Live. Uh, this is our first stream. Uh, we're excited. So please like and share with uh, everyone. Uh, we're actually live on Facebook too. <laughs> bravo. Bravo to you. Yeah, bravo you with go. your surprises. So I, I, didn't, I actually didn't know I turned it on, but we're live on, live oh. on Facebook. So, okay. but uh, now and, and I, everyone. I, my nervousness went away. Now I'm getting more nervous. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're also live on Clubhouse. So. Uh, thank you for everybody who's tuning in. Um, you know, uh, we, we're, we tend to do this just the recording, but we'll have the recording live on, uh, or it should be live on all the uh, major platforms tomorrow. Um, let's, uh, talking about the dynasties, um, after the long reign of the uh, Rubenid dynasty, um, 
Yeah. How did the uh, Hetumid dynasty succeed them? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, so uh, that's an important. So the Hetumids, why they were actually one of the most powerful noble houses before you know actually becoming the royal house of the kingdom of Armenia, and there was they were you know uh, often at odds with the Rubenids, they clashed a lot with the Rubenids. Obviously, you know, they were also kind of like power hungry. Um, so uh, when uh, uh, Levon the Magnific Magnificent, uh, we, as I said, he was, all, you know, without a doubt, the most outstanding king of this period, uh, passed uh, in uh, 1219. He, his daughter, uh, Zabel or Isabel, she basically became the queen of Armenia in 1219. But she was, she was very young. She was like five, six years old. So, uh, so basically, as a guardian, as a custodian of her rule, uh, Constantine had to meet, was actually assigned by the Armenian nobles. So, you know, Constantine had to meet uh, this guardian, custodian, advisor, I don't know, like we call him a different way. Uh, he basically, you know, said, you know, uh, we have to end this feud. And he was right. Obviously, he himself was a head to meet. So he decided to basically marry off uh, the head to meet prince, head to the first, who became head to the first at that time, prince head to, uh, with uh, Queen Zabel or Isabel. So when Hetum married of the Hetumid house, married with uh, Zabel, basically he became the new king of Armenia. So she was the queen regent. And in 1226, why, uh, after marriage of Hetum and Zabel, he became the new king of Armenia. And thus, in 1226, Hetumid became the new royal house of the kingdom of Armenia. So the I succession... See. It, it was a very smooth succession yeah, Lot yeah. Of, because before that, I don't want to get into that. There was a lot of infighting between the Rubenids and Hetumids. So this was a good way to bring these two powerful houses together, yeah, you know, through yeah. marriage, through marriage, which is yeah. like more, 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 yeah. more movie, more movie yeah, references, yeah. Family yeah. Ties, you know, yeah. uh, which is very common practice of the time. Uh, so basically this ended this long standing feud. And the Hetumids uh, ruled Armenia after that for mm, a little bit less than like a century and a half. Well, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip over your question. And that's since fine. we're talking about dynasties, I mean, you know, we had, uh, how did the Lusagan dynasty take over? If this is the marriage. Right. And Lusagan was like the shortest period of dynasties, right? From yes. what I know. Yeah. Yes, they were. How Maybe they we're take? jumping a little bit ahead, but I know, I'll I just cover wanted, that. Yeah, okay. okay. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, so like the, the Lusignans, which in French is Lusignan, it has like a French, uh, it, it's a French origin. Uh, already by the time of Levon the Magnificent, uh, Vahe, he actually married, uh, married uh, Sibylla of uh, Lusignans, the Lusignans were the, oh, by the time of Levon the Magnificent, the Magnificent, they were the ruling house in Cyprus. The Lusignans, oh, which was okay. a French, very powerful French, uh, you know, noble and aristocratic and royal house, the Lusignans. Uh, so basically, um, and, and Zabel, you know, and they were basically like, after that, the Lusignans were already, in a way, they also had, just like the Hetumis had matri matrimonial ties with the Rubenids, so did the Lusignans, right? Because, yeah. like, he married into the house. Like, Queen of Armenia was uh, Sibylla Lusignan, wife of Levon the Magnific Ma Magnificent. So, uh, later on, after the male line of the uh, Hetumids in uh, 30, 1342, why 1342 uh, ended, the Lusignans automatically uh, inherited the title. And Got Constantine... It. Constantine IV in 1342 became the first Lusignan king on the Armenian throne. So, so uh, he actually, yeah, so he actually became the first Lusignan monarch, and the Lusignans, you know, ruled until the uh, uh, kingdom of Armenia until its fall. No, so, uh, correct me if correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. I mean, you're mentioning a prominent a uh, French lineage, right? 
becoming involved in uh, Gilikian dynasty. Yeah. Um, I know, I think I might have read in one of your articles, Gevork, that during the time of the Crusades, a lot of the more powerful nobility that we had in Kilikian times or in that time era um, had a very strong relationship, especially with the Franks. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, Mike. That's a very good point. And we have to point out when we say Franks, at this time, all Western Europeans in the you know, sources, especially like uh, Eastern sources, they were called the Franks. Yes. So basically, when we say Franks, I know, like the French themselves, the later French played a huge role. Sure. But it wasn't just the French. Like it was even like uh, somebody like Frederick Barbarossa, like mm-hmm. the Holy Roman. It was called Frank, you know, by like I don't know uh, authors of that time. So almost by default. Abs- right. Right. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Like uh, we talked about the intermarriages. Yes. So it was like, uh, you know, I didn't mention that, but like oh, most of the queens of the kingdom of Jerusalem were Armenian princesses of the Armenian, like Rubenids and other families who actually, you know, intermarried with the crusaders and vice versa, as I said. So there was a lot of intermarriage, uh, Mike, between the like Armenian aristocracy yeah. and the Western European aristocracy. So this is how the Lusignans obviously inherited the throne uh, how all of this played. And as I said, like a lot of this, even when we look at the sources of the time, like there were noble families of complete Western European, uh, you know, extraction that were already playing a key role in kingdom of Armenia. When we look at the names, when we look at their, we have family aristocratic names, they're like, you know, Western European families that were already like a uh, very powerful princess in the kingdom, you know, like in the, in the chivalric, you know, system, right? They were like lords, uh, princes, barons, uh, knights, uh, marshals. Marshal, that's another word that we inherited, marshal, like the military commander. Really? From this time. In Armenian, it entered like Marajacht, like as a marshal. That was another thing that entered during this time. Wow. Uh, uh, we still have it in Western Armenian, by the way, for, for marshal, you know, the word Marajacht. So, uh so like uh yeah i mean it, that, that's like they, they it's already it was very important but another important development we jumped a little bit ahead i want to cover during the head to me period if if i may if you have if you don't have other questions sure go ahead. sorry that, that that was my fault i think yeah yeah no, it's okay it's okay yeah there's some my, period before yeah. like the 14th century yeah, you know, yeah we should, I, it might be me, my question <laughs> for me it was no, no, okay. wait, 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 hold on for me it was like salt <laughs> cuts <and kiss>. <laughs> 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 we were just going through the dynasty. I was like, why not cover them all? I mean, what's the point, you know? <laughs> so, all right, let's go back. Let's go back. Why not? Right. <laughs> why not? You're stealing my thunder, man. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Gavin. Uh, yeah. Um, um, I just wanted to cover like a little bit from the head to me period why an important development. So we're not just immediately jumping to the Lusignan period. Um, yeah. Uh, the the Mongols at this time were like I knew it. A huge. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Yeah, you're right. So basically, in uh, around the time that the Hetumids came to power, this was an important upheaval because you know Genghis Khan, like everyone knows Genghis Khan, right? He created this worldwide uh, empire, huge, yeah. probably largest in the world, you know, empire. Uh, maybe the British Empire was larger. That was arguably like ever, uh, or the Russian Empire. But like um, uh, Genghis Khan w- was like a Mongol Khan. He created a huge empire, and by uh, the 1240s, the Mongols basically even conquered the territories in Armenia, reaching all the way to you know Cilicia, this area. So uh, obviously, uh, like. An important development that ha- happened is like the Seljuks, the Seljuk kingdom of Iconium, which was a sultanate, as I said, like in the heart of Asia Minor, it was like a neighbor of Cilicia and a rival. So the Seljuk Turks, we know that obviously they yep. you know, conquered in the 11th century, right? Uh, territory of Armenia extended their rule into Asia Minor. They became like a neighbor of you know, kingdom of Armenia, Cilician Armenia, and a rival. 
But what happened, uh, guys, is by uh, the when the Mongols came, they actually fought against the Seljuks and they defeated the Seljuks. Yeah. And shortly after, the Seljuk Sultanate of Iconium or Rum, it's called Iconium because it was based like in Konya, which is in Asia Minor. It's like it was their capital city of the Seljuks. Uh, it's it, you know the Seljuks after uh, several defeats at the hands of the Mongols. There, uh, soon after, not immediately, but soon after 1243, it started. Their sultanate started to disintegrate. So Hetun the first, who whom, about whom we talked about, he actually saw that the Mongols were without a doubt, doubt a very powerful force. Uh, that was quite obvious. Uh, so made the decision to make an alliance, not only against the Seljuks, but actually more against the neighboring Muslim states to the south, like the Emirates of Aleppo, Damascus, and, and you know these these territories, uh, and against especially the Mamluks of Egypt, yeah. who were also a rising power at this time. Uh, very deadly power later on, also for 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 our kingdom of Armenia. They were they were sl- the Mamluks were slave warriors, were they not? Yes, yeah. yes, you're right, yeah. absolutely right. Initially, they were like captured slaves. Yes. Basically, you can say, Mike, this was like the early Janissary system that later the uh, Ottomans also adopted. Yes. Uh, it was like a way when the captured slaves of you know Christians, Muslims, etc., they were raised into this like a military tradition and eventually they became the ruling power in egypt they were muslims so interesting in yeah, yeah 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 but you know uh so but the mongols initially they fought tooth and nail against these muslim states so they were naturally the mongols being a very powerful empire armenians allied themselves with the mongols so hetun the first mike he actually initially the first contacts were made right after 1243, after you know defeat of the Seljuks by the Mongols, and especially 1247, a very powerful Armenian military commander, uh, you know, constable, Swarovic, Bundestable, as we said, uh, Sambat was brother of uh, Hetum the first. He actually ventured to the uh, in 1247 to the Mongol capital, capital of. A Karakorum in Mongolia and made uh, an alliance with the uh, Mongols, formalized the alliance. And that trip uh, later on was followed up in, in, in his footsteps by Hetum I himself. So Hetum also in 1244, uh, tw- I'm sorry, 1254, he actually went to the Mongol capital of Karakorum and he sealed an alliance with the Mongol Khan an armeno mongol alliance against especially and first and foremost against the you know these uh, states yeah. the mamlu uh, aleppo damascus these muslim states and he made this alliance with mokke khan who was the khan or khan of the mongol empire and for half a century that alliance was very important in fighting off the uh, muslim forces Mamluks and their allies. Uh, however, unfortunately, Mike, uh, by early 14th century, first of all, the Mongol Empire disintegrated into various other, like uh, states, Mongol empires. Yeah, like smaller and, empires. and this was this was right. this is what led to Kilikia's eventual fall. No. Yes, one of the reasons. Yeah. One of the reasons. Yeah. Yes, one of the important reasons. You're absolutely right. And Mong- uh, the, first of all, the Mongol Empire disintegrated into several smaller uh, empires, the Ilkhanate, the Golden Horde, and other. Um, and what happened is the Ilkhanate, which was the closest to Cilician Armenia after the disintegration of this vast empire of Genghis Khan, it adopted Islam. So the, uh, the, uh, so the rulers of the Ilkhanate, which was the the empire of the Mongols adjoining closest to kingdom of Armenia, it adopted Islam. So their stance quickly changed, not as an ally, but more sympathetic with the Mamluks and the others. But I have to say, before that, there were crucial victories and powerful battles. Obviously, there were defeats as well. Like, sure. for example, yeah, in 1266, 
the Armenian armies uh, lost to the Mamluks. Uh, it was this battle of Mari. But in 1299, the Armenian and the Mongol army scored important victories against the uh, Mamluks. So there was this tug of war. But For decades. When, yeah. decades. Decades, yeah. Very crucial battles. Uh, but unfortunately, they, they played an ultimately negative role, uh, especially after when the Mongols already switched sides as you can say, they switched sides and joined uh, the Muslims, the Ilkhanate. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, you know, that was an important geopolitical uh, change in throughout the region. And also, uh, uh, Mike, uh, another important thing, the Crusader states one by one fell in the 13th century. Uh, Acre being the last, you know, Crusader yeah. stronghold fell in 1295. Only Cyprus, being an island nation, remained. Lusignan Kingdom of Cyprus in remained well into you know 15th century because it was eas- easily defended as an island by the Lusignan kings. Uh, but other like uh, Crusader states they fell, and there wasn't as much as interest by the Cru- by the Western Europeans by the papacy. We didn't talk as much about the papacy, but I have to you know make that point that during this time definitely the leader of the west west or western world western europe was the pope right because this is a time before the reformation Mm -hmm. before the secularization of these nation states so the pope was the ultimate leader so all the armenian kings when they were communicate to western european monarchs would usually do it through the papacy through the pope through the vatican you know, uh, and, you know, for example, like during the coronation of Levon the Magnificent, the Pope himself sent, you know, his representative, you know, who was there in the, so this was very important, King Levon the Magnificent and other Armenian monarchs, they would, you know, communicate with the Pope. And there's a lot of like archives, a lot of the um, uh, letters of our kings are in the Vatican archives, Yeah, uh, Mike. We actually have a very beautiful, like, uh, with a seal of Levon the Magnificent, golden seal uh, in the um, Vatican archives, his letter to, to Pope. Uh, and, you know, uh, also, should, like... You should lead into that, because we've, we've basically talked about the fall. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Um, so that that was another thing. Like, unfortunately, there wasn't as much as interest, and uh, uh, like maybe we should uh, point out that uh, there was also a lot of like uh, when there were uh, communications with the Pope, like of uh, uh, papacy. A lot of times they insisted on unification of the Armenian Church with, uh, with. the Catholic Church. So they said we were like sister churches, the Armenian Apostolic Church, mm-hmm. right? The Catholic Church. But, you know, the popes often insisted, insisted that there should be complete unification of the two churches. Uh, but this was a point of contention within, you know, Armenian elites. You know, some favored it, uh, Mike, but a lot of the clergy, different aristocratic houses, they weren't in favor you know, they said we have our own national church. We should stick with our own national church, as you know, Gregory the Illuminator had established in you know 301. Uh, so uh, there was like uh, this uh, point of contention. But let me tell you, a lot of the time the kings they actually said, yeah, we have to. You know, there were even like uh, consuls, Armenian church consuls, yeah. that favored unification and proclaimed that yes, we're united with the Catholic Church. Then there were like a uh, a different council would actually negate that decision. You know, this also created a lot of friction, Mike, because when push came to shove with these Muslim powers and Armenia needed help from, like, the West. West, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Pope would insist that, you know, until our unification is not finalized, I cannot guarantee any support, military, financially, or otherwise. Uh, and unfortunately, this was also one of the reasons, Mike, that, you know, uh, th- that eventually led to the downfall 
So oh, it was it, basically not siding with them. I mean, it's it seems like it's the same type of politics that's existed for thousands of years. Yeah. You, know, you do as you're told yeah. or else we're not going to, you know, yeah. look at and uh, it, it, I can't even imagine what type of terrifying. backstabbings has, has happened even yeah. through the oh, church, you know, yeah. with the Catholic oh, yeah. church. I'm going to, I'm going to keep my opinion. What is myself. interesting is, is also, it also like aggravated a lot of these Muslim powers because like the Mamluks, they said, look guys, you like a foothold for these, you know, Christians f- to, to, to come to our region. So we have to eliminate this kingdom which is like a foothold for later crusade, for a possible hypothetical new crusade. Yeah. Or like many crusades, right? So like as long as this Christian state of Armenia continues to exist, you know, it can be impossible. Like, so we didn't get the help that we needed at this time when, you know, in the 14th century when uh, there was a lot of fighting with the Mamluks because by, by the 14th century, the Mamluks were the most dominant power uh, yeah. in this region, in the Levant. You know, uh, there was also another like uh, Turkey principality of Karamans, uh, Karamanids or Karamans, uh, which was also like occupied parts of former um, Seljuk Sultanate. Yeah. That was also a threat. But the Mamluks were the stronger power during this time, like in the like uh, first and second half of the 14th century. Uh, but then again, when the Mamluks started their wars, they, they were pretty clear, Mike. They were saying like, look, you, you guys are like a foothold. We have to eliminate. So it, it actually created a lot of uh, problems of course for, it did. Uh, for us, for yeah, Armenia. And because, you know, but, you know, our kings were, but another important thing, like when you look at these kings, we have to put it in its proper historic and cultural and context. Like a lot of these kings, they were like, oftentimes very devout, you know, uh, Christians. So, like, when they would take their vows as a king, the right, it was also like a, you know, spiritual Christian right, even like a church right of coronation. And then, Mike, when a lot of times they would, like, retire, they would become, like, monks. They would retire to a monastery and pass it on to, like, their offspring or a closest relative. They would, like, retire to a monastery as as monks or or. For the, for the queens, uh, they will retire as nuns. Yeah, servitude. Servitude yeah. at the end and of, yeah. And they will basically end their lives in this piety, mm-hmm. in, you know, meditation. So, like, we have to realize, like, this religion played a very crucial role during this time for everyone. Uh, and, uh, you know, and Armenian kings were not an exclusion. So, this point of contention of should we keep our religion's doctrine, our doctrine is better than the catholic doctrine it's more archaic it's more apostolic this was a huge uh, you know point of contention and then unfortunately politically it was it it played a very also negative uh, role and you know as i said like one of the geopolitical reasons uh, for the downfall of, of kingdom of armenia um, before I ask you my next question, uh, there is a question from Albert on Clubhouse who asks, uh, what is the connection of Sophine and uh, the burial of the horses? Is there a connection of the Mitanni Aryan uh, uh, Vedic gods? Right. Uh, well, it's it's kind of off topic question, but it's yeah. OK. Uh, yeah. I know. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so like, obviously we have many archaic sources that saying like Armenia was the source of horse breeding. So one of the earliest, if not the earliest horse breeding centers. So the Marianu were the cavalry of the ancient kingdom of Mitanni. So in the second millennium BC, so that's like thousands of years, even before Cilician Armenia already are, you know, in Armenia, we had a very, uh, Developed tradition of horse breeding, of cavalry, of yeah, just we, mountain. We've talked about that. We're yeah. Almost, we're, almost right. half of the episodes we've covered. Yeah, we've talked <laughs> about, about yeah. Okay. So yeah, to so like, to answer, I don't know if that answered the question. And Sophine is actually Armenian talk. 
So it was also very important, you know, horse breeding center. Yeah. It was one of the provinces of Armenia, Sofim. So yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think also in this area. Yeah, Albert. Uh, Albert's question. I, he mentioned his daughter's name is Sophie, so he was interested about. Oh, that. okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there you go, Albert. That, hopefully, we he answered, or yeah, the, we answered your question. Um, my my next question uh, is, um, you know, what happened to Levon the fifth after his capture? Right. Right. So, uh, like uh, the Lusignan kings ruled very briefly and. Uh, Levon the fifth was the last Lusignan king to rule Armenia. Uh, not well, actually, I'll, I'll talk about that. Like you can argue, it wasn't the last, but like he rose to the throne in 1374, uh, and by this time, why already there were huge attacks by the Mamluks, you know, and I mentioned the reason, or well, one of the important reasons, key reasons, uh, on on Armenia, on kingdom of Armenia, and. Basically, he led this last ditch defense of the capital Sis, but it fell, and then he retreated to the castle of Kapan, which was in Cilicia. It wasn't Kapan of today in Sunik. It, it was named also Kapan, but it was a different castle. He retreated, and that was like you know he that was the last stand. But you know he was just you know uh, were they were they overpowered by just too much coming at once like i mean yes they're known yes, for absolutely. being yeah. i mean it was like uh like the mamluks definitely had the superior forces in numbers in arms in equipment by this time already okay because as i said the kingdom of armenia in this constant warfare had weakened uh it lost before that it's important ports which were uh, like ayas and all the others yeah. and not all but most which was which were important uh uh, revenue centers for the kingdom lost lost them to the Mamluks, uh, and then uh, you know it weakened after that. So yes, they were definitely at this time the superior force. Why? Uh, and unfortunately, the Armenian side constantly asked for reinforcements from from the papacy, from Western European states, but uh, didn't get it. Get them, uh, and you know he, he actually king. He was a king, Lusignan. So. He also asked officially, but didn't get that help. So he was unfortunately captured. Uh, he, but he very gallantly, you know, he said, "You have to spare the population, and I will, you know, uh, surrender." So it was very gallant, like chivalric king, as as you can say, all of our kings or most of them were. He surrendered. Uh, by, he was taken captive by the Mamluks in the capital of Cairo in Egypt. And then he was in captivity with the royal family uh, until uh, 1382. So in 1382, uh, unfortunately... Wait, what year captured, was he captured? I'm sorry. 1375. 1375. 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, so he ruled for like a wow. couple of years. He just ruled for a couple of years. By, and, and then he, he was, was captured, captured for... Basically, well, he was under ca- in captivity in for captivity seven years, for yeah. seven years. He, yeah. he was in. He spent like seven years in captivity in Cairo. Okay. Uh, and then before that, there was a, like a, a Franciscan a monk by the name of John Dardell, who actually even became his personal secretary and friend, who visited Cairo in uh, 1377, and he promised to free him. He said, "You know, on your behalf, I'm gonna, you know." Uh, actually call upon the kings, uh, various European kings, to actually free you. And eventually that, you know, as, that call was answered by John of Castile, who was the Castilian king in modern Spain. So John wow. of Castile the, actually... The Spanish king yeah, we, sp- we, sp- we spoke yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yes, he actually paid the ransom. He, bailed he him paid out. the ransom for Levon uh, Lusignan. It was a very large ransom. He paid it and this is what is amazing. Not only he freed him in 1382, he actually said, you know what, Levon, I'm going to make you Lord of Madrid, which is the present day capital of uh, Spain. Wow. He made him Lord of Ma- Madrid. So like in modern terms, like the mayor of Madrid. Now, did they have some Madrid. kind of a relationship before that? Yes, That's a good they question. were related. I mean, like, because like, all, like, uh, all of these like uh, families, they were like bloodlines. Like uh, the Lusignans were very much one of the very much tied houses with different houses throughout Europe. 
So okay. they were very much like with the French, with the English, with 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 the other monarchs. So yes, they were they were very much, uh, especially with the French and the English. No, I mean that makes sense because I mean it's just like random. Yeah, king. I mean you Lu just bring dynasty, him, right? you know, pay him all this ransom. <laughs> yeah, bring like, him up. There's even a city in in, in uh, by the way, there's a city in uh, France called Lusignan. It's like uh, it's like traditional uh, hometown of the Lusignans uh, in in France. Wait, is it is it uh, spelled is it spelled Loisin? Lu- is it's that spelled is that L U S I G N? Okay, then I have a different city. I'm thinking the, the, of a different the, the city. G is, yeah, it's the G is silent. Uh, Mike. It's like the word cognac. <laughs> yeah. So the G is silent. It's yeah. in French. Uh, so yeah, so basically he became the Lord of Madrid, uh, and uh, after a couple of years, actually, guys, he actually left. Spain left Madrid and moved to uh, another of his relatives, Charles the uh, uh, sixth of uh, France, mm-hmm. King Charles the sixth of France, who actually gave him like a palace uh, in Paris uh, as a king. But why did Levon move to Paris? You might ask. Because at this time the, the, the French and English were fighting the hundreds war. years war. Yeah. Yeah. So like when Levon moved there, he said like, uh, "Look, you know this is crazy. Like you know our lands, Holy Land, my kingdom, and other like former Crusader states were overrun and occupied, and you're fighting each other. You know, like I said, they had a very strong religious convictions, right? So we should launch a new crusade." to liberate kingdom of Armenia, to liberate all these uh, Christian lands yeah. that are occupied we now instead this, of yeah. you fighting each other. So he actually, guys, he actually went even twice on a diplomatic mission to England, to the court of Westminster, to um, Richard II as an ambassador of peace, saying like, look, end this stupid, you know, 100 years yeah. war. Let's, let's unite our forces. Let's concentrate on, 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 on the foes who have taken over our lands in the east, the Holy Land and other lands. And he visited in 1389 and 1392. He w- visited the court of Richard II in Westminster. So that was the royal court yeah, of yeah. the English kings. Uh, but unfortunately, as you know, his missions were not successful. You know, the Hundred Years' oh. War continued. And the French and the English continued to kill each other. Yeah. You know, there was no new crusade. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think he also requested help to go back and get, yeah. Sis, like, yeah. reconquer yeah. Sis, and Sicilia, right? Yeah, and they just refused. Yeah, th- this is what I'm saying. Like, yeah, he huh. said, I would actually lead this force. Yeah. You know, we, w- I would lead the force to liberate kingdom of Armenia, kingdom or, or, or other these uh, former uh, Christian states. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, it came to naught and... Um, he passed away in, on November 29, 1393 in Paris, and he was like honorably Levon the fifth. He was actually honorably buried in the Celestine Chapel, which was an important resting place of French kings in Paris. And then... Uh, is is after, the tomb still there? This is a very good question. So, uh, 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 during the French Revolution, uh, the Celestine Chapel was destroyed because, you know, the, during the French Revolution, the kings and queens were viewed in very bad light by the revolutionaries, and they destroyed a lot of these tombs. But what happened is his tomb was basically ravaged. Unfortunately, his remains were, we don't know what happened to them. They were taken out of the tomb in the Celestine Chapel. Uh, but his tombstone and the uh, like, the tombstone with the effigy, with his like carving mm-hmm. sculpture on it, survived. And later on, it was actually moved to the Basilica of Saint Denis, which is an important, uh, another resting place of French kings. And now, at least his tombstone with his effigy is like lifelike sculpture, which is very beautifully executed. Guys, it's very well done. Like it's early Proto Renaissance, mm-hmm. uh, late medieval uh, carving. It still survives, and it's in Saint Denis. You can actually see how our king, our last king, Levon V, looked like thanks to this effigy 
which is in Saint Denis. So all of you who visit Paris, <laughs> make sure to pay a visit to the Saint Denis Basilica, and you can see his uh, his tombstone, his effigy uh, there, like his crown with a crown and a scepter with the all all the garb is beautiful, beautiful. Wow. Yeah. Uh, let, um, I want to talk about. You know, there's. I showed you the trailer of. Uh, there's a movie in 2019. I don't know if it's a short film. What they were trying to do. It, it looks like it was just a trailer. Well, I think it was a short film or whatever. It was called Cilicia, the the uh, the line, the king of the lion what is it? king or something. The, yeah. the land of lions. The land yeah, of lions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that about? Like, because I mean, the trailer is amazing. Yeah, that was like a short film, short movie. Uh, they they're they're still actually planning to produce like a full feature film, mm -hmm. uh -huh. like a Hollywood production type of film. The amazing thing is why it was made in Armenia. So uh, I think Ashok Arakelian is the director. Yeah, uh, I saw that name in the in the in the credits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's like they made a tripartite short film, short. So each film if uh, i believe is like uh, well together i think it's like 15 minutes or something okay, I see, okay. so but they they're yeah big it's like a teaser more of a teaser of a no, no, short I, it's, film it's, yeah it's a it short looks, film it looks, like, like, it looked like a pitch deck yeah it, you know i mean i saw the trailer and then I, I i read that it's a short film but i don't know where it, if it was ever even released or what it was uh i yeah, the, the, the uh, why the short film was actually released. I actually saw it. It was very well done. Yeah, it was released in Yerevan, and there was a screening in LA and different uh, cities as well. Uh, uh, in Europe, uh, I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken. So I mean, if you're uh, talking about three fifteen, that's a forty-five minute, you know, short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. No, 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 no. I think it's total in total. Oh, total 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Okay, got but, it. Uh, I'm sorry. Like they want to do eventually like three parts in like maybe each like two, three hours. Got you it. know, this is this is their goal. Yeah. Uh, but th this one was very short. Uh, and then, uh, but it was very well done. I, I was very impressed, to be honest. Yeah. Like the acting uh, and everything, like it was for most part like there were even actors not like armenian but like yeah it looks like not, not too many armenian yeah, but actors. it's again it's a great it doesn't matter it doesn't have to be armenian actors no no it's no just, not it's all. a great it's story a period yeah. and it's a very interesting time especially with the crusades well, being involved that's you know, where i was getting yes, at great it. story Absolutely. yeah that's where i was getting at i, I think it, it should come to life yeah. you know and well and yeah i mean like level the magnificent was like the close friend of richard the lionheart he was yeah. a yeah. close he friend was. of frederick Bar Barbarossa. I mean, these are like huge historic figures, and like our Levon the Magnificent was like you know their their friend, their confidant. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's like you know our part of the story is not told uh, in in this like non-Armenian, unfortunate like Hollywood films and sure. etc. So we have to definitely like the films is a very important way to tell the historic Armenian historic narrative to the uh, to the world, you know, at large. I, I just cannot emphasize it enough. Yeah. So I totally agree with you guys. Like, you know, we have to get our foot into this, you know, especially like, you know, obviously the Hollywood industry is very of course. important. Of yeah. course. I mean, it's, you know, well, well, who was it that said it in the last, was it the last episode? Was it Vahan said, you know, it's through art or was it Yerisha said through art? It's really important to tell our story artists yeah. and, you know, it doesn't oh, not necessarily just yeah. artists, but any type of art form. Film. Any type of art form. Yeah, it doesn't make a difference. But film, I think, is one of the most powerful Absolutely. ones. Absolutely. If not the most powerful yeah. ones. Yeah. Yeah. Visually, I mean, you know. Um, yeah. Visual. Um, let's we'll see how many more questions we got. Uh, well, we got we've got two more questions, yeah. but I mean, I guess we can kind of tie it together, you know. Um, well, here, I'm just going to ask, and then, so after, after Levon the Fifth, um and what happened with him uh who were the kings and queens that basically took over Kilikia, the kingdom of armenia and Kilikia after the lucinian uh kingdom of cyprus or right, a fall of right, the lucinian that, kingdom of cyprus right that's a great question uh mike uh like oftentimes we think that you know with with uh levon fifth ending his rule in 1375 that's the end of the kingdom of armenia mm -hmm. that's not true that's not true let me let me say why it's actually 
in the mountainous area of Cilicia, the Armenian local rulers actually retained control in the Taurus Mountains because these Mamluk forces, obviously, they couldn't have able to penetrate these areas. Yeah. And, yeah. And in the coastline, in the coastline of, like, there was an important castle of Korikos, Korikos, which is on the Mediterranean coastline. This castle was also retained by the Lusignan kings of Cyprus. So after Levon the fifth, basically um, two things happened. The uh, branch of Armenian no, uh, Hetumid family, the house of Nerid, Nerid, actually crowned several kings in mountainous Cilicia in the Taurus mountainous area, Taurus mountains area, and they ruled until 1424. These these kings. Loc uh, locally in this area, in this pocket of mountainous Cilicia, of the house of Nerid, which is an offshoot of the Hetumi house. At, at the same time, uh, Mike, also the Lusignans retained control of the former kingdom of Armenia until the coastline. The coastline, they retained it until Orikos, an adjoining area on the Mediterranean coastline, until 1448. 1448, that's wow. like what, like 70 years yeah. after the end of reign of Levon V, right? So it was the Karamanides, Karamans of, like, remember, a Turkic kingdom that actually eventually was able in 1448 to take over this area, Korikos, an adjoining area. And you can say effectively, this is when uh, de facto, de facto, uh, end of Armenia, kingdom of Armenia came about. However, the de jure title, titular uh, title of kingdom of Armenia was still held by the Lusignan kings, right? I mean, obviously, they were the natural heirs. So it was passed to, first of all, uh, uh, Peter the I, Cyprus, Lusignan king, and all the succeeding uh, kings that came after him. Uh, so after... Uh, that uh, after the fall of the Lusignan kingdom of Cyprus in 1489, in turn, the title was passed to uh, the house of Savoy, which was basically, again, matrimonially tied to the house of Lusignan, which is, again, a very important and powerful uh, European uh, uh, royal house, the house of Savoy. Uh, and what is amazing, guys, that... Um, even the Italian, uh, like in Italy, Italian kings who were from the house of Savoy, and uh, they continued to carry the title of uh, kings and queens of Armenia. So can you imagine like the king of Italy until 1946, he, he was the reigning king and in the 20th century, he actually carried that title. King really? of Yes. And today, Mike, even today, like, um, uh, various, uh, you know, their uh, offspring of King of Italy, the House of Savoy, the Italian Savoys, they're still the rightful heirs of the kings and queens of Armenia. And they actually carry the title. Uh, Vittorio Emmanuel, Prince of Naples, mm -hmm. and Emmanuel Filiberto, Prince of Venice. They are, if, if, let's say, hypothetically, if the kingdom of Armenia would be restored and it becomes a monarchy instead of the republic that we have yeah, now, yeah. they would be the kings. They would, they're the rightful heirs through their, you know, lineage for the kings and queens of Armenia. Can you imagine that? <laughs> That's crazy. That's wow. actually really fascinating. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, um, uh, well, I mean, after all this that you've, I mean, it, you know, talked about and, and kind of told. I mean, it's, it's almost like a beautiful story listening to Gail talk still, about I'm this. I'm still stuck on. I'm still stuck on the fact that we had Armenian knights. Yeah, but I can oh, pick yeah. your brain about that some other time. So, uh, you know, uh, what became of the like the history of Cilicia after the 15th century? Right, right. And that would be my last question. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so in the 16th century, by the 16th century, uh, the Ottoman Empire was 
rapidly, as we know, expanding earlier, as we know, in 1453, it took over Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. And by the 16th century, it also took over Cilicia, the area of Cilicia, formerly Kingdom of Armenia. And but um, Armenians still, for most part, retain their semi-autonomous rule again in this impregnable mountainous area, mountainous Cilicia. So even Ottomans took over in cities like uh, Cilicia and mountainous Cilicia of Zeytun, uh, Hajin, in these cities, cities like that uh, in this mountainous area, Armenians retained their local rule, semi-autonomous rule. Uh, they would maybe at times just pay a tax to the sultan, but they were you know, left alone. They were you know, governed themselves. They even had their own armed forces, their own sort of uh, thing. And it's interesting that it was Zeytun was the place in mountainous Cilicia that had its local lords, Armenian lords, and Armenian local uh, even you know defense forces, uh, armed formations. That when the Turks, uh, the Ottoman Turks, tried to impose harsher measures against the Zaytun Armenians, uh, Armenians of Zaytun, they actually, ha- you know, resisted. And in 1862 was a very famous Zaytun resistance, which is considered to usher in the Armenian national liberation struggle of the 19th century. So it's quite interesting that, you know, even the semi-autonomous rule in this area can you see how much it's connected to the last vestiges of Armenian statehood, of Armenian independence, and also served as a spark for the new national liberation movement of the 19th century, which Zaytun was yeah. beginning in 1862. Uh, so it played a very important role, and um, you know it remained so until 20th century, and then... As you know, in the 20th century, uh, what is interesting, Cilicia was still majority Armenian. Armenians, so the Armenians, yeah. yeah, Armenians constituted the largest, uh, uh, you know, people in this area. It was, you know, there were Turks living side by side, other nationalities, Kurds, etc. But Armenians were still the most numerous in Cilicia, um, and um, you know, um, that's why the Turks. In 1909, they actually attacked, especially the city of Adana, which was a very populous Cilician Armenian city. 1909, they massacred the young Turks, massacred some 40,000 Armenians in Adana, the Cilician Armenian city of Adana, which actually was an attempt to sort of like, you know, uh, again, drop the Armenian population just basically by killing off the Armenians. And as we know, before that, in 1894-96, there were already the Hamidian massacres, you know. Uh, and of course, you know, it, with the combination with the Armenian genocide. And again, what is interesting, if during this time, Cilicia and Armenia would to play a key role in, you know, Armenian defense, in defending uh, the, what was, you know, during the genocide left of the Armenian people. We know of this heroic Musa-Ler resistance, right? Yeah. The 40 days of Musa-Ler or musa Dal, as later on this famous writer Franz Werfel would write. So some few thousand Armenians, they resisted and, uh, you know, uh, actually rose up. And then basically, you know, in Musa-Ler, uh, yeah. fought off this invading Ottoman genocidal forces and succeeded. You know, they raised this huge banner with a, like a white banner with a red cross. And a French steamship, military ship passing by in the, Gulf, in the Armenian Gulf or Armenian Gulf of Alexandretta passing through there. Uh, he, they actually saw it, this, this banner, and they came to the rescue. And eventually after, you know, some days of resistance, uh, they actually rescued the Musalertis that actually resisted the Turkish onslaught, genocidal onslaught. So, as you can see, it's uh, you know played vital. Well, unfortunately, 
you know, after World War I, some Cilician Armenians again returned to, to Cilicia and they believed that, you know, after World War I, the Turks were defeated and them being the perpetrators of the genocide, they would be actually punished and our roles would be over. But, you know, that was a, like a false dawn, unfortunately. Yeah. Even what is interesting, uh, uh, Mike, in the Paris Peace Conference, uh, when the Allies, especially the British and the Americans, they said like Armenia should unite parts of, uh, you know, Cilician Armenia and uh, Armenia Minor should also be part of this Armenian homeland. It's without doubt also Armenia, yeah. definitely. And uh, there, there was to be uh, the British and the Americans at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, they proposed this Armenia, a vast Armenian state encompassing parts of Cilicia, Cilician Armenia, and parts of Lesser Armenia. So Armenia extending from the Black to the Mediterranean Sea, mm -hmm. so it would have access to the Black and Mediterranean Seas. Uh, that was the that was the proposal by the Allies, by the, by the by the British, yeah, uh, and the Americans, especially Americans. President Woodrow Wilson was a strong you know, friend. Uh, Gazan type falls in that region, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, who knows? Because my both my parents' side are from Gezan type, and yeah. I would have probably still been there if that was the case. Yeah. You know? I mean, actually, my my ancestors, uh, why for my dad's side, are also from mine top. Yeah. From yeah. mine top, the area. So yeah. Yeah. it's like yeah. <laughs> so it's quite interesting. Uh, but you're absolutely right. We actually in 1921. Speaking of mine top. There was a huge resistance and a battle of Eintop against encroaching Turks, Kemalist Turks, who, you know, they were obviously not happy. They didn't want to see Cilicia part of Armenia. So they attacked as early as uh, February 1920. That was one of the first actually attacks by the Kemalists against Armenians. You know, it was in this area. They slaughtered tens of thousands again, unfortunately, in places like Marash. They slaughtered the Armenians there. They attacked Eintop, but uh, unfortunately for them, they weren't able to slaughter the Eintop Armenians because they resisted so well for more than a year. They totally threw off the uh, attacks of the Turks, you know. Uh, yeah. But again, the odds were overwhelming, and unfortunately, you know, uh, you know the, I don't want to jump too much into that, but the Allies had to be more firm but they kind of a little bit, unfortunately, flip-flop. And then, you know, this area, which Ally said definitely would be part of the Armenian homeland, eventually with this Kemalist, uh, with the support of the Bolsheviks and uh, others, uh, and unfortunately the Allies, which was very detrimental to their own, you know, interest in the long term, I, I would argue. Uh, you know, we had to, the Armenians again, for had to abandon Cilicia, and the last Armenians in this area abandoned it uh, in 1922. But another pocket of Vahe, that was the la last pocket of Armenians, remained in around Musaler. So this area was still French controlled. It was part of the French controlled Syria mandate, this Armenian Gulf area around Musaler. Yeah. And a lot of Armenians still lived here as late as 1939. But unfortunately, again, this area in 1939, which was not part of Kemalist Turkey, was illegally handed over to the Turks. And the last remaining Armenians, they had to again leave this area. And they, you know, left for uh, Syria and Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, so like yeah. a lot of the Anjar Armenians, for example, they left this area and established the village of Anjar, which is in... Uh, Lebanon. Uh, there, there's only one village that in 1939 decided not to leave. It's completely Armenian, Christian Armenian village called Vakov. It's still there. That's yeah, only my parents Vakov. have been there actually. My parents went. Oh, wow. they, they okay. went to. They went to. They uh, just. I mean, years back, they did a whole trip through Western Armenia, and they went to that town. And they have video. I have videos of them. Uh, actually, with the Armenians that live there, singing, dancing. Um, That's cool. Yeah, and my mom actually Amazing. found someone who has a last name that connected her. I, I don't remember, but 
yeah, I, I know about that. You know, there's a lot wow. of a uh, lot of Armenians in 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 Turkey that that oh, don't I mean, even yeah, I mean, know about that. There are Armenians, Armenians but yeah. this is like the only Christian yeah, Christian, Armenian yep, village. Yeah, Christian, there yeah. are a lot of like crypto Muslim uh, yeah. villages and population is huge, like yeah, millions. Yeah. But this is like since they go by like the you know religious connotation, so yeah. they consider this the only quote unquote uh, Armenian village. But it's yeah. not. You're yeah. right. And, and just the last point, like. There's a surviving also vestige of our ancient kingdom, last kingdom, in the form of the Catholic Crusade of uh, Cilicia, which after the genocide relocated from Sis to Antilias in Lebanon. So it's called the Catholic Crusade of the Great House of Cilicia. And we have Catholicos Aram the first, you know. Yeah. You can say that's the last vestige and the last piece of uh, Cilicia that we have today wow. surviving. That's amazing. That's amazing. It's yeah. a great story. It is. It tra- is. Yeah, you know, tragic ends, but this is the way the world works, right? With well, with everything, everything that must go up must come down. I guess. But well, you never know. There's always hope. One well, day. Well, again, you know, it's just still a great piece I mean, of that's, history. That's that's one of the reasons that we can't stop. You know, fighting for for you know no, no, our no, lands, absolutely. our. Uh, yeah. For our rights, for our rights, I would say for our rights, for, yeah. for the truth. Uh, why, you know, yeah. for but our the truth, the moment. truth will eventually, hopefully, bring those lands back. You know, because how long? I mean, I don't want to get political, but yeah, you know, uh, this can't go on forever. You know, um, yeah. But um, Gevor, this was so uh, enlightening, and thank you for always this is you know the second my pleasure and honor show. as always you uh, know by guys the way, thank you for doing this and thank you for the opportunity like no i problem. said last time like you know you're doing amazing job i hope this turns into like a worldwide movement you know yeah. Army yeah. of knowing ourselves <laughs> really our our culture, and you know <laughs> not only armenians non-armenians as well you know our yeah. brothers and sisters you know we, we, we have some interest in our history but some. You know, first and foremost, our own people who are often ignorant of their own history and culture. So yeah. you Agreed. guys are doing an amazing, amazing Agreed. job of, you know, enlightenment. Yeah. Thank you. Well, well, we have we have people like you who are, you know, you know, we have your information and many, many others such as yourself um, who provide so much amazing material for us to be able to pick from and look into yeah. because it sparks our curiosity. You of know, course, to look into these topics. I mean, you you take it to another level. Yeah. We can only do so much, so we're humbled. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, Gevor signed a 99 year contract with us. Did he, he really? Yeah, he did. He's going to be right, with us. Yeah, I did. <laughs> when are we celebrating, bud? When are we celebrating? Um, but uh, thank you for being on our first live show. Uh, unfortunately, we're competing against the Dodgers, <laughs> it looks like. Uh, but um, thank you for everybody who joined us. Uh, Gevor, again, um, you know, I know we have so much to cover with you. I know we're going to go to an episode where we're going to uh, cover Levon, you know, the Magnificent, his entire, um, you know, it's very difficult to cover, you know, 200, 300 years in, in an hour or two hours. So yeah. uh, we definitely are going to dissect uh, You're right. the, the, the kingdom of Cilicia. And there's so much more about it that we want to talk about specific events that took place. Um, so uh Gevork, again thank you so much yeah, uh, and uh we will it's always a pleasure yeah and um, any last uh you know no, mentions no, you want to um, say or you know, anything no yeah all right Just, again keep up the great work i'm here for you guys always again thank you so much you know and you know hopefully this this will you know this will be the spark you know uh yeah. that will ignite this interest in in our people worldwide so thank you again for doing these amazing, amazing programs. Just thank you. Thank my you. honor and pleasure. Really and I appreciate you waking up early to be with us. I know <laughs> you still got to go to work. So thank you again. And <laughs> yeah. we'll talk to you shortly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Gabriel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thank Have you. a good day. All right. Well, that was interesting and uh man i i love talking to this man it's yeah. it's, it's it's next it's, next time next time we should get him on when it's cold or yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hush. Well, i can't wait till he comes to the u.s yeah. back to the u.s yeah, so we fun. can or why don't we go over there 
I, I, I can take this with me. Let's, I can take this with me. And as let's long go. as there's internet, we can do this from anywhere. There All these internet. mics, there's everything, internet. we can definitely there's take internet. it. Um, well, uh, again, everybody who's watching us, thank you so much. We appreciate this. It's our first live show. Uh, I think we did good, you know. Um, a uh, few mentions, you know, uh, you saw in the bottom, we had our sculptures. They are for sale. Um, the, but visit us at medheadosnet.com uh, to get the sculptures, T-shirts, this T-shirt that I'm wearing. We have also Digan on the Great. Uh, if you like our show, you want to support us, please, uh, you can go to uh, patreon.com at medheadosnet. And I'm going to show that right here in the bottom. There you go. See how cool this is? Um, you can go ahead and, uh, um, you know, become a, a Patreon. We have three tiers. Like it starts yeah. at $5. It's just to support the show. But, uh, you know, we already thank have you. Thank you. Thank so. you for those who have already started to support yeah, the show. Yeah. Um, besides that, what else? Um, um, I can make a quick mention about sports. No, no, don't. No, no? don't. No, no, okay. no, no, no. We're not doing that. Um, so, again, thanks. Uh, I don't know. Until the next episode, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Till next week. Till next week. All right, everybody, take care. Have a great night. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you.